This one's gonna be a little touchy. I'm making this video because I've had quite a bit of pushback from certain fans of AMD, not fanboys per se, but I mean, they, they wanna see AMD do well, that's fine, I guess, who seem convinced that Ryzen CPUs are better for Adobe Premiere Pro video editing. In fact, they've referenced several tech YouTube videos that point to chips like the 3900X crushing Core i7s and Core i9s. And sure enough, after a few minutes of searching, I found this data, but all of these tests seemingly omitted one important Intel factor, the IGP or Integrated Graphics Processor. So how big of a role does it play in 2020 in light of discrete card acceleration moving out of beta? Is the Ryzen 9 3900X or XT in this case, finally a better fit for Premiere Pro than equivalently priced Intel offerings? This is a video specifically for Premiere Pro users. It will depend on the software suite you use, whether or not I recommend Intel or AMD at the end of this video. But if you're a Premiere Pro user, this one's for you. Let's investigate. The stylish Be Quiet Shadow Rock 3 offers exceptional cooling while maintaining a silent profile thanks to a PWM Shadow Wings 2 fan. And with a 190 watt TDP, expect plenty of overclocking headroom. Click the link below to learn more. So for this video, things are gonna be fairly straightforward. Two identical systems save the motherboard. And since Ryzen is more RAM dependent than Intel, I've made sure to include a beefier 16 gig kit at 3600 megahertz, which is a sweet spot for both of the platforms. PCIe 4 won't affect throughput on our graphics card, but I'll leave it enabled on the Ryzen system because, well, it's available, blame Intel for that one. And stock CPUs all around, so a 10700K and 10900K, both with MCE disabled to keep these chips closer to TDP spec, and a Ryzen 9 3900 XT with PBO enabled, but that's as far as I've gone with AMD, again, because PBO keeps that chip within TDP spec. So that's an eight core, 16 thread, 10 core, 20 thread, and 12 core, 24 thread mashup, only the lower core count Intel offerings will have IGPs enabled. So that's the important distinction between these two, apart from different architectures. Uh, and the IGP will require a bit of tinkering in the BIOS to enable. So only after we've enabled it uh, here can we successfully install Intel UHD graphics drivers, which tends to be the thing that you know, causes a bit of concern for people who are trying to just download the drivers outright and don't realize that you actually have to go into the BIOS and manually enable the IGP before you can install the UHD drivers. Once we've got that set up, we can see our IGP idling along with our discrete RTX 2080 Super, and that's all it takes. It does, it's just a few minutes of extra, you know, BIOS tinkering, but it's really not anything to be super concerned about. It's not a reason why you wouldn't want to use it in an Intel system if you had an IGP in that Intel chip. Now from here, we'll throw in a 10 minute 4K 60 clip recorded from my GH5S at 150 megabits per second into the latest version of Premiere Pro, which is 14.3 in this case, as of time of filming, it's the latest uh, public release, it's not in beta anymore. This is important because previous versions won't utilize discrete GPUs during the encoding process, and I do feel that will have a huge impact on our rendering times. The same clip will be rendered, of course, unedited in all three trials, and we'll run each scenario three times, and we'll pick the middle option, assuming that they're within a few seconds of each other, Spoiler alert, they all were. There was something weird going on in the background. Uh, so you would have seen nine total render times. I'm just gonna show you the middle one because again, they don't deviate very much from the mean. For the exports, I'll select H.264 and the default high bitrate format at 40 CBR, that's constant bitrate. And I'll ensure that hardware coding is enabled uh, for the renders. I'll also make sure that the graphics card is being properly utilized during each render so that results aren't skewed between platforms and we're running the latest NVIDIA drivers. I don't remember what they are off the top of my head, but I ran all these tests on the same day. So same drivers. If I see anything strange though, I'll be sure to mention it. Are you ready? Let's start with the Intel systems. The 10700K with its eight cores and 16 threads managed a fair 266 seconds or around four and a half minutes for the 10 minute export. That is not bad, but let's throw in the 10900K. The 10 minute render, 255 seconds. So only about 10 seconds faster than a processor with two fewer cores, but more on that later. Now let's throw in the 3900 XT. Wait a minute, 329 seconds that's five and a half minutes, uh, a whole minute slower than the 10900K, which again, has two fewer cores. This can't be right. And look, I know a single minute isn't a huge deal in the grand scheme of things. You aren't likely to notice much of a difference in real world use, but the fact remains that these Intel chips, at least with their IGPs enabled, are still better for video exporting in Premiere, 
even with CUDA accelerated rendering helping out uh, thanks to our RTX 2080 Super. You could throw any NVIDIA card in here, you'll still have help from that card. Next, I took the same clip, reduced it to 10 seconds, and then I warp stabilized the clip. So uh, I deal with this quite a bit, especially when I'm on the go out of the office or if I'm filming without a tripod, and the time it takes to stabilize can massively affect my workflow. I have to wait for that clip to finally warp and stabilize before moving on to something else in the timeline. So it's important to me, and that's why I've included the test here. The 10700K managed to stabilize the clip in 5 minutes and 21 seconds, while the 10900K managed to shave off a little over 30 seconds. But what's really got me all worked up here is the 3900XT, nearly a minute and a half longer than an 8-core Intel chip. That's the weaker of the two Intel chips tested, which tells me two things. Warp stabilizer optimization sucks, as indicated by the system usages while it's happening, and the effect is still Intel biased, at least to some degree, and that was pretty typical of Adobe Suites pre-Ryzen. Warping doesn't seem to utilize much of anything when it comes to system resources, save RAM, which is why you'll probably want 32 gigs or more in an editing rig. It's not the only reason why you'd want at least 32, but it is a good reason why. And we're only using 16 here, mind you. But back to the render times we showed a bit earlier, why on earth do both the 10700 and 10900Ks scale so horribly? What I mean by that is, these times are wicked fast, but we'd expect the 10-core variant to perform, what, around maybe 10 to 20% faster than the 8-core one. Uh, well, that's not what we're seeing here, and the reasons have to do with recent hardware encoding optimizations in Premiere. Again, CUDA acceleration, something that we've seen kind of playing in the background with some small color edits and things like that on the timeline, but never with rendering. When you render a video, the graphics card literally did nothing pre-version 14.3. So you can see here that much of the workload is dished to either the graphics card or the integrated graphics processor in the case of the Intel chips. The CPU cores themselves aren't really doing much of anything. This changed on the Ryzen system, where the missing IGP forced its cores to work a bit harder, resulting in slightly slower render times, but the fact remains that our graphics card was still a serious workaholic throughout these renders overall, minimizing the effect of core count on total time. I'd never actually sat down and watched system resources light up like this while rendering, so it was actually pretty cool to see, personally, and uh, it was also very insightful. So there you have it, the latest Intel chips, when set up properly at least, are still better renderers in Premiere Pro than the latest Ryzen offerings, and it's all thanks to optimizations around the IGP. I get a lot of flack for showing Premiere Pro renders when I'm comparing Ryzen and Intel chips. When I enable the IGP and the Intel chips blow the Ryzen chips out of the water, the reason why is just because the Ryzen chips don't have it. So therefore the test is somehow unfair, or maybe people just don't know about the IGP and the hardware encoding optimizations around it, and they just assume I'm working some kind of magic or just fudging my numbers, I'm not sure, but uh, there's a really good reason why I still use Intel in my personal rig. It's because of Premiere Pro. If I was using any other editing suite, or if I was just gaming on that system, or I don't know, <laughs> even doing something as simple as using a Microsoft Office suite products, I don't know, Microsoft Word or Excel, I would go for a Ryzen CPU instead of an Intel one. I think that they are vastly superior from a value perspective. I think that you get the most bang for your buck, clearly, from Ryzen chips, especially the 3600. Uh, but in the case of the 3900 XT, which is one of the best desktop grade Ryzen chips you can buy, and something like a 10700K, which is uh, comparably priced, it's not identical, but close, assuming you can find it in stock, I would go with the 10700K at 8 core 16 threads over the 12 core 24 thread option from AMD purely from a rendering standpoint, but also because warp stabilizer, even just scrubbing on the timeline, just much smoother overall, something I can't really measure and show you in a video, but uh, I just get much just better reaction from Intel chips in Premiere Pro. And I think, again, a lot of that has to do with optimization still. The IGP is a huge help. Uh, I just showed you that. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is, I've, I've switched back and forth a lot. I've worked with so many of these Intel and Ryzen CPUs of the past two or three years, and uh, I can tell you, personal experience, I'm not being paid to say this, I don't know why I don't assume that, but uh, I would go Intel every day of the week if I knew what I would be doing a majority of with my system was video editing in Premiere Pro. It's just, just how it is. Now, if you're gonna use DaVinci Resolve, whatever, maybe the Intel, or the, excuse me, the AMD chips are better, that's great. I haven't tested that because I don't use DaVinci Resolve. I think I did in like one or two videos where I was just benchmarking it for the sake of benchmarking it, but uh, I use Premiere Pro. That's why I show that benchmark in a lot of my CPU review videos. 
I'm sorry if you don't like that. You can watch other reviews. I encourage you to watch other reviews anyway so you get a more well-rounded picture of how uh, products perform. But yeah, I made this video not, not to feel superior to prove you wrong, but well, I guess I could kind of make it to prove some people wrong. They were just assuming that Ryzen was better because that's what they were seeing elsewhere. And I guess that's fair to an extent, like you're trusting other trusted reviewers. I'm not trying to knock on them for not enabling the IGP. They have the reasons for why they don't. But I personally think it's a sin to not enable it when it comes to Adobe Premiere editing uh, and rendering. I think the, the render times that some of these tech YouTubers are showing are just a bit dishonest because they're not enabling the IGP. Why wouldn't you enable it? If you had that at your disposal in a Ryzen chip, I would expect you to do the same thing. If the, if the you know options were reversed and the AMD chip did better with an IGP, I would enable it in the Ryzen chip and I would just float without it in the Intel one, right? Uh, if, if Intel didn't have it. So this isn't a red versus blue thing, right? Please don't get mixed up in the hype behind each company. I want both companies to succeed because that means that we'll do better, uh, we'll be better off as end consumers. Uh, isn't the competition is fierce and the prices are driven down because companies wanna be the best value out there. Right now that's clearly AMD, but I hope eventually that the tides will turn or at least somewhat where we have real competition in the high-end CPU space. Right now you can't even find a 10900 or 10900K in stock for MSRP or anywhere close to that. Third parties are selling them on Amazon for insane amounts of dollars, like 800, 900 bucks. For a Core i9, that's ridiculous. A desktop grade Core i9. Don't buy that, don't be that guy. If you guys like this video, thumbs up, click the subscribe button. I'll catch you in the next one. My name is Greg. Thanks for learning with me.